just by way of introduction before I get into the slides, um, I need to share my screen on Zoom, don't I? Let me just sort that out. Okay, here we go. Cool. Now I weirdly feel like I'm in a meeting. <laughs> it's just like it's, you know, 1 p.m. and I'm doing my job, um, which is generally talking about GraphQL and schema-driven development and basically the same stuff that I'm here to share with you tonight in person, which is really nice. Um, so here's a fun little tie-in I recognize from this homepage here that Josh had up earlier. This fun little widget, which is, there are a few tells once you built something like this for long enough. This one is definitely React Select. And if we follow through to the React Select homepage, um, wait, oh, did we take it off? Uh, we took it off, an early version of this. This was actually originally built because we needed it for a thing called Keystone.js. Um, and that actually used to be linked from the homepage. So like little fun little tie-in from the first talk to the second talk. And that brings me to my next, or well, my first slide, which is, who on earth are you? Hi, everyone. I'm Jed. It's nice to be here at React, not React, GraphQL Sydney, <laughs> the other meetup. Um, you have muscle memory for sure. Uh, it's not going full screen. Oh, that's all right. We'll go from here. So yeah, it's really, really good to be talking at a meetup in person again. Um, I was remembering with Boris, who's a colleague in the audience here. Um, he's the co-founder of uh, another consultancy in Sydney, like Alembic, we're Think Mill. And we're reflecting on the fact that it was, we think November, 2013, when I first presented a really super early version of the stuff that I'm gonna be showing you tonight at a MongoDB meetup over in Haymarket. I was like first meetup talk. So it's been a while since then. Um, and as we worked on this, we've sort of gone past the, oh wow, we can write code and ship it to NPM phase of our lives onto the, why are we doing this? What, are the, what is the point of doing this phase of our lives? And that brings me to my talk this evening, which is, about the concept of a single source of truth and why that's important, how to achieve it or how we achieve it in some projects um, and some of the tooling and ideas that hopefully you can take away from this into your own projects. So single source of truth, what do I mean by that? It sounds really obvious, but in this specific context, we're talking about a schema. Um, in the way we like to develop applications, uh, you know, software products, it's nice to start with the schema because that's basically, if you've heard of domain driven development, um, this, is, this is how we map that onto the tooling and the way we work today. So what I want, like all I really want in life is to be able to start with a schema and then not have to worry about the rest of the stuff that we could get without repeating ourselves knowing what we know in that schema. And so that means I'd like a database please. And there's a bunch of ways you can go from a schema to a database, including installing access back in 1998. Um, this one's a little bit more modern that I'm showing you today, but okay, nothing new. When I change my schema, the next thing that I want is for my database to be migrated. Most of the time, diffing two snapshots of a schema should be enough to give me a migration from point A to point B. Cool. Uh, now we're basically an ORM. What about a GraphQL API? Now, this is not gonna be a complete thing if all I've got is my schema, because all we really know about are the nouns. These are the types or the things in the schema. We don't necessarily know what we can do to them, but we can take a really good guess. And the first four that come to mind are create, read, update, and delete. So nailing the CRUD for that schema in a GraphQL API, plus all the corresponding like sort by different fields and filter by fields or load related items, like that's, that's a thing I'd really like to get for free because I already know enough to get that most of the time. Um, and if you've got my GraphQL API and you've got my database, hey, how about that bit in the middle where we get query and mutation resolvers for that? I don't really need to write that by hand, do I? No, no, I do not. Um, but if you've pushed something like this to production before, you can probably see the gap that's coming in here because yeah, that's not super safe. We need more than that. We need some access control. I should be able to 
annotate my schema with enough information, ideally to say that different person who's accessing it, maybe an anonymous request from the internet versus a authenticated request with particular role or permissions or relationships in the database, do or don't let them do certain things. And then finally, if I've got all this stuff, I mean, that's my backend sorted, about my front end. The next thing which Josh previewed is from the GraphQL API or specifically the schema associated with that GraphQL API, we can get front end types now. Ain't nobody got time to roll that by hand. Why would you? Crazy. And finally, um, this is actually enough in most cases to build an admin UI. And if you've ever used something called a headless CMS, that's what's going on. So this is what I mean by single source of truth. I don't want to be sort of defining knowledge about this system in more than one place. I want to have one clear place that owns the definition of the schema and enough that I don't have to repeat myself to get these other things. Because then what I'm left with concentrating on at each of these levels is the database. You know, I can annotate that with indexes or I can create views, right? I can worry about like bespoke migrations that I need to, that there wasn't enough information encoded in a schema diff to give me. I can worry about like the functional aspect of my access control or how session management works. I can worry about, you know, the custom queries that are optimized for specific use cases or the mutations that include more business logic than just your average CRUD mutation. Finally, I'm going to have a lot of other types in my front end, but the idea is to kind of let you special, specialize and do the least work necessary to express what's important to each part of this stack by deriving as much as possible from a single source of truth. So this is what we aim for. This is actually the theory behind a lot of the work that we at ThinkMill have been doing for the last few years. How do we get a development and production workflow and environment that allows us to live this beautiful utopia? Um, how do we deal with all of the exceptions that come up along the way? So why do we do this? Why have we spent so much time thinking about this? Well, probably already answered that in the last slide, but here's a few reasons that came to mind. First off, this enables rapid iteration. You can start with an idea, describe, get, you kind of practice describing that as a schema. And then once you've got that in place, you can just start working on the, um, like the interesting parts of the problem. Uh, and if you need to go back and change that schema, you can keep iterating across the stack knowing that you're supported, everything is in sync. It's genuinely really, really fast, particularly in early project development, but not everything's green fields forever, not everything's early development. Once you have a mature system that is achieving this goal, you can push changes to production significantly more confidently. And I say confidence, it's not about being fast, Fast comes with confidence. It's about getting confidence that when this new version of the API is released, my front end isn't going to explode. I, under, I, can, I can see those changes. I can see the implications. I haven't like missed a part in what is fundamentally quite a large and distributed stack now in my application. It also does help us get that domain first workflow where you think about how do you represent the answer to your problem space? or how do you represent the problem space itself? What are your domains? How do your different models relate to each other? Like that's really what's defining the functionality that ultimately your users are interacting with. By thinking about that stuff first, early and often, uh, it also gets cross-team alignment. It lets everyone engage with it. You can start with, we have, let's say in a blog, users and posts, and one user can have many posts. Or is it that multiple users can be related to a post? If you've got that answer, your designers are gonna know what they need to design on the post page. They're gonna need, they're gonna know what to design on the index page. Once you've decided what that schema looks like before you've even built out your back end, your front end front enders can probably get a scaffolded API with stub data in it and the types they need to just start building it, hopefully iterating on a prototype with the designers at the same time. So there's a lot of benefits to teams working really closely together. And what we found is that starting with this schema and keeping it foremost in the development process gives you a shared resource, a shared asset that you can actually work on, that you all kind of look at and iterate on together. And from that comes everything else. So all of the specialized skills that appear um, happen, but you can track changes. You can have conversations about it. It's a reason to jump in a room or a Zoom 
with someone and say, hey, I think we need to change this. And everyone's on the same page. It's really good for that. So I'm going to show you an example project that's open source on GitHub. You can check it out at home if you like. This is a stack. It's not the only way of achieving this, um, but this stack includes Keystone.js, Next.js, Prisma, TypeScript, and something I'll introduce tonight called TSGQL, which is why I put my hand up when Josh asked, does anyone know better than, anything better than uh, GraphQL code generator? Actually behind the scenes, TSGQL is using um, code generator. So the GraphQL code generator is a dependency. It does a lot of the heavy lifting of taking GraphQL schema and converting it to types. We've put some clever bits around that that you'll see that make it a little bit easier to plug into a project without it changing the way you're writing code. Um, yep, so there are many stacks like it. This one is mine. But something that I want you to take away from this talk is this, oops, uh, should I order my slides slightly differently? Um, I'll come back to that thought in a second. Let me just quickly cover off like, how I want you to think about Keystone in the stack, because of all the things in it, this is the one that I personally have been kind of most influential in building. These days, after iterating on a lot of different ways of explaining what this thing is, um, we've sort of stopped calling it a headless CMS because that's a lie. It can be, but that's not really what it's actually best at. Um, and I've started realizing that it's easier to think about it as an ORM with interfaces, higher than you would normally associate with an ORM. It's just taking care of the data access and CRUD, but it's doing it in a way that exposes a GraphQL interface and a data management interface. Because those are such high level things, that means it also has to encompass certain other concerns like access control. Um, but I'll quickly show you what this is before we dive into a live coding bit. Because when I dive into the project, it's been written, there's gonna be quite a bit and I wanted to just show you like where it starts. So. To get Keystone up and running in a project, uh, this would be what your initial package JSON looks like. You just add it as a dependency. You then create an entry file for it, keystone.ts, which exports a config. All I want to know is where to find the database, what type of database it is. And we've also told it to use migrations. The other thing we're adding here is this little lists, uh, which we're importing from our schema. This is the source of truth. This is the schema that we're talking about in the single source of truth. It looks like this. If I was building a to-do app, I'd have a to-do list, which would have fields on it for label is complete and who it's assigned to. And I'd also have a user, which has got a name, email, password, and whether or not they're an admin, as well as the reverse side of the to-dos relationship there, the to-dos that are assigned to that user. Now, when we're leading people through thinking in a schema first way, incidentally, I know I'm getting a little bit off the source of truth thing here, but the way I really want everyone that I work with to think about schema design and development is we're just defining types. Each one is an independent thing in the system. You could call it um, a domain, you could call it a type, you could call it a table, whatever, model. It's just a thing, really. Um, and then what you want to do is express the way those things relate to each other. It's all about having the types as like independent, discrete units, and then putting them together in, funnily enough, what looks like a graph. Thus, GraphQL, Sydney. And, um, anyway, once I've got that schema and that entry, I just run the CLI and we're up and running. I'll actually show you this in a minute, but I wanna show you a couple of things about, um, before we get to the real code, how this is going to be expanded on to get some of the other things I mentioned in the opening slides. So starting with this schema, actually, before we add any more code, have a look at what just got added. You'll note the green stuff on the left is what hasn't been committed to Git yet. We now have a migrations folder because the first migrations got generated. That actually happened with Prisma. That happened because we generated a Prisma schema. Super handy. The Keystone schema is a superset of the Prisma schema which means we know enough to generate your Prisma schema for you and keep it in sync. Um, so we're not defining a database access layer or our migrations independently from our core schema. It's also enough to generate us a, a pretty handy GraphQL schema. Again, the Keystone schema format is a superset of GraphQL schema format, which means we generate these files. Now, 
Josh made this point in his talk, and I want to reemphasize that this stuff wants to be checked into Git. Put this in your source control um, for a lot of reasons, but one of them is it lets everyone see how the schema is evolving over time. If I add a field, I want to submit a pull request. When Dinesh looks at it, he's going to be like, Jed, why did you add this field? What's this doing? We haven't talked about this. I'm like, oh, yeah, we should sit down and talk about the fact that I'm share I'm changing the schema. Um, you want to track this stuff. Also, it makes CI and everything else work better, which was Josh's point. Anyway, moving right along, let's just extend this config with something else. Um, this is sort of getting into Keystone features that give us, in this case, authentication and session management, which is kind of important because one of the next things we're going to want to do in our lists is add some access control. So what we're doing here is in our schema, adding access control to say who can read the email field. Um, anyone who's an admin can read that apparently, if I'm reading this code correctly. Um, and also is admin. Um, reading and updating are both linked to, you can only do that if you're already an admin. Interestingly, that um, data that we've got in the session query came from this session data piece right here. So whenever a request comes in, we're going to load that data using that is actually a GraphQL query or it's a fragment. Um, so then we've got that available. And then we can add some access control for lists themselves. So you can only update it if you're logged in um, and either if you're an admin or if you are the user being updated. Um, we could do the same thing with to-dos. We could say admins can update to-dos. Otherwise, you can update the to-dos that you're assigned to. So encoding things like access control rules is really nice to put in the schema as well because it keeps it that sort of central signpost. You might get some of these functions and actually put them in separate files that you can import and reuse. There's a million things like that in line are going to get unmanageable. But then what's happening is your schema is still acting as like the signposts it's saying, hey, access control is over this way. This is the one that's being used here. Um, or for something like validating data or before and after hooks or firing events on an event bus, um, all that sort of stuff. Again, the schema gets to be the signpost saying like, hey, there's logic over here. You don't have to go looking in a hundred different files to figure out what is going on and how the system actually works. You've got, I think of it like imagine a town, a town with a town square and in the middle of the town square, there's just like a signpost pointing at everything. So as your system grows and evolves in complexity and has more stuff in it, you're going to still know where to go to find where all of this logic is actually hooked into one central place, your source of truth. All right, that's enough of me getting code in keynote slides. Stuff takes way longer than you think it does. Let's look at some actual code. Um, this is the repo that I'm going to be demoing. Yes, it's getting long in the tooth, but in my defense, this is actually the first meetup talk I've had a chance to give since this was recorded online a year ago and things have moved a bit since then. So, all right. Um, let's have a look at this. So, I really want to jump straight into the magic because that's the fun part to demo. But first, I'm just going to have to do a little bit more of like, this is what's going on. So let's grab a terminal. What we're looking at here in this repo is actually two projects um, sort of sitting side by side in the same directory. This is not ideal. I wouldn't do this in like a real, real life application. Um, I'd use a mono repo. In fact, a lot of the time, what you find is a mono repo with the services folder in it and an apps folder in it. And inside the services, there'll be one of these. Inside apps, there'll probably be a couple of Next.js apps, maybe a React Act Native. You know, this is how they scale. But just to keep things nice and simple, um, these are both in the same place. So if we have a look at the package, JSON, what we've got is a Next.js app, which is in this pages folder here. Has anyone not used Next? Just, sorry, yeah, okay. Next is like combination between server-side rendering and a React router. It's like just, yeah, React pages, server-side rendered, and it's easy. So in my pages folder here, I've got a home page. Um, and this demo is just a simple blog app with people, authors, and posts. And then this app is what's going to get run when I run the command. Go back. 
package JSON site dev. And then I also have the same, I have the Keystone project in the same folder. So there's a, here's my Keystone entry point. Um, and that's the one that's going to run when I, um, when I run the dev command. So I'll do that. I actually need two terminals because there's two separate processes here, one for my front end, one for my back end. Um, let's start Keystone first. Oh, fun. Why did that break? Uh, yes. I'm going to start by running. Oops. Reset DB. Yeah. I wanted to blow that. No, what? Come on. Live coding. I actually know what happened. I tested this before I came and did it live. And in doing so, then rolled back my Git history and it left an empty directory because Git weren't deleted empty folders and so by testing it ironically i broke it for live coding that was clearly had a lot of practice at this recently anyway um okay so what's happened keystone has started because i reset my database it has applied the starting migrations which were committed into source control and now i should actually have a server running ta-da Hey, all right, cool. Let me just create a user. Password is password. And off we go. Not now. Cool. All right. So what we've got running here is like I was saying, schema, migrations, database connection. Um, Prisma and GraphQL. So far, so good. Oh, and the admin UI. Um, but wait, there's more. Not only do I have an admin UI, what it's talking to is a GraphQL API. So if I want to query users with names, there I am. That's the initial user that was created for me. Now, What I'm going to need to do before I start the front end um, in order for it to do something interesting is just create a post quickly, mark that as publish, set it to today, and some content in here. All right. There we go. So now if I just quickly, here's my API. There we go, everything's working. Now, if I come back to VS Code and I start my second process, this is now should have given me what port was that on 8,000. As the front end. Isn't it beautiful? I really need to get one of our designers to help me out with this. Um, there's my front end. So there's my full story. That's my next JS app running, hitting that GraphQL endpoint. So aside from the fact that I clearly need some design help with my blog, um, this is a lot of stuff for relatively very little code. Um, and that's because it's not really doing much yet. It's really just got like a half dozen different types in there. But I'm still pretty happy with how much functionality I've been able to create in like just so little code. But um, I haven't shown you the cool part yet. And I'm going to now. Let's say I've got my schema for posts here. Uh, where is it? That's pages schema let's have a look at the content section um let's pretend for a minute that i didn't have a 
intro section. And what I want to do is put, actually, no, you know what? I'm going to put this on users just for something different. Let's say I want to add a byline or like a title to a user. Like I want to say I'm Jed, I'm co-founder at ThinkMill. And then we want to show that in the front end. How are we going to do this? Well, we're going to add a field. Byline, we just add a text field. Save that. And now ooh, something stopped. That's not running Node anymore. Um, what's happened is Keystone has told me that my Prisma schema has changed. Please restart it. Okay, I did change the schema. That's what happened. Single source of truth. Run yarn. Oops. Run yarn dev again. And now it's going to be like, aha, uh -huh. dipping that against your database. I see you've changed it. Let's create a migration. Um, I'll call this add user byline. Cool. And yes, I will apply it. Thank you. Sweet. My database has been migrated. And look, I've got some diffs. There's the alter table that needed to run. There's the new field being added to all of the right parts of my GraphQL schema. There's the field being added to my Prisma schema, which is how the migration got there in the first place. Um, and there's the source of where I actually updated it. And now if I come back into the admin UI, let's just have a look at me. Here we go. And here's my byline. I can just add that, save it, it's there. So this is what we get when we're working with something that is designed around the concept of this single source of truth. Um, there's a couple of other things that I want to show you. Now, the first is obviously my work here is not done because actually, even though I can get at this data, like author byline, right? Cool. I've got, I can query it, but I need to put that in my front end. And since my front end is written in TypeScript, well, I want it in the types. And this is where TSGQL comes in. So let's have a look at the post page. And this is where I'm, I might have an author. I can see that that's typed. I really want to add like, if that's there, you know, um, probably post.author.byline maybe. Is that what I call the field? Yep, auto, auto complete knows what I'm meaning, but TypeScript is telling me that that's not going to work. I haven't loaded that data. If I come down to the query that actually fetches that post, I'll add byline in here as well, I guess. And then I'll save that. And I look. Rats. <laughs> Why are you not doing your thing? Yes, there we go. Ta da! Come on, that was the cool part. That's the cool part. Um, so the, the good part about this, right, is that if I then pushed a different kind of change to my schema, like I removed a field or I renamed a field or anything like that, and I didn't update one of a hundred different pages that I'm querying that data from in my front end, I'm going to open a PR and GitHub is going to be like, wow, wow, you have branch protection rules on this branch. You can't merge this. Your CI failed because we're running TypeScript checker in CI, aren't we? Aren't we? Good. Um, yeah, it gives you a lot of confidence. I made one change to one file in my schema and then everything else reflected that. So you can move with speed and confidence that I've not seen before once you've actually got this kind of stack working for you. I say this kind of stack because like I said at the open, like there are many stacks like this. This one is mine. Um, and there's a bunch of different tooling out there to Josh's point about like, this being an open standard. Uh, apparently you shouldn't use Apollo type gen, but definitely there's a lot of great stuff around GraphQL from the guild. Um, and then there are other tools like Keystone out there, but also why are you using data CMS, dude? Keystone, come on. It does great types. You wouldn't have had that problem. <laughs> uh, um, 
anyway, look, that's that's almost the end of it. I just want to sort of show you one last cool thing about this, um, which is when you're controlling this much stuff from one source of truth, if you've worked on a really sophisticated system before, you're probably sitting there thinking like, yeah, Jet, but come on, come on. It doesn't scale. It doesn't, does it? What about what happens when you don't just want CRUD? And this is actually a thing that we spent heaps of time working on. Um, and I'll just show you again, just our solution to it. Um, with one of my favorite features in users, not the byline that I added, but we have this field here called GitHub username. Um, and if I enter a GitHub username, what I want to be able to do is get the repos. So GitHub repos. Now, what is in here? Oh, look. Yeah, I want the name and I want to get the Stargazer account. Cool. No GitHub repos for me yet. Does anyone think I have GitHub repos in my database? No, of course you don't. That'd be ridiculous. Um, this is why GraphQL is so cool. What I described at the start around defining types and then just stitching them together with relationships. We are not limited to stuff in our local system. This is so far, it's got all the benefits that we used to like about monoliths and systems like Ruby on Rails and Active Record, but it's also got the benefit of scaling out well because you can create types that don't exist inside of your database and still relate to them the same way. So you can stitch in microservices, you can stitch in remote APIs, and that's exactly what this is doing. Um, if I come in and actually enter my GitHub username, you'll see two cool things. First of all, if I run this again, there are my GitHub repos. That's happened because what I've added into my uh, schema here is a virtual field with a non-nullable list of GitHub repos, and this type is defined elsewhere. Another great project I'd encourage you to check out called GraphQL TS. You can think of like GraphQL TS and TS GQL as sort of like reverse. One is taking a GraphQL and generating TypeScript from it. The other one is taking TypeScript and generating GraphQL types from it. Neat. Um, we use both of them. We, we wrote both of them. Um, so defining an object here called GitHub repo with the fields and resolvers as needed. And then we're also defining the resolver for that, which in this case is just going out to GitHub's public REST API and fetching me that data. So I can traverse local types that are owned by something that looks and feels a lot like a CMS in this instance, but it's then actually joining to data in remote services um, over HTTP, which is super neat. Um, and because we don't stop there, the admin UI actually then has a custom React component that takes that type and shows me a custom interface so that I can also see and manage that content in my CMS because otherwise you're going to have content that was never manageable. So it is cool to have a single source of truth, but you really need to use tooling that's going to let you break out of that box when you need to. You don't want to end up sort of back in like 2012 where everything has to sit inside your own local database and you can't interrupt with other services as needed. So yeah, there's like, that's basically the, the thing that we learned on the way to trying to solve this problem. All right, so that brings me really close to the end. Um, recap, this is what we mean, uh, or this is what I mean when I talk about like the goal of single source of truth in, in schemas. Um, all of this stuff can and should, in my opinion, be driven from a single source of truth and not duplicated. It gives you more confidence. It means you're writing less code you didn't need to, less room to mistakes, easier to just be writing and reviewing the important differentiating code that makes your project unique, not all the CRUD basics. And thanks, that's me. Thank you, Ted. By remote people. All right, we're gonna do a quick Q and A. Oh yeah, Q and A. Any questions? questions. No. Nope. 
Mesh them together. Absolutely. Yep. Yep. So what I what I showed you was um, the the question for everyone remote was if you're stitching in uh, remote APIs, is there a good way to kind of merge them? Right. Like if you had another GraphQL API that was outside of your system and one that's inside your system, like the one I demoed, how do you do that? Um, and the answer is that GraphQL is inherently very, very composable. So you see a different set of things written around it in the ecosystem. Uh, like Apollo has federation. Uh, there's also a library called GraphQL Mesh, which is maintained by the Guild. Um, these are or, or that one that I was showing you in Keystone. I'll show my screen again and show you that. Um, the way we did this in Keystone is um, basically like the purest form of this. We have also got a mutations um, schema that we're oops, that we're creating. So you can see, like this is if you've ever just done the Apollo one on one type defs and resolvers is how you build your GraphQL API from scratch. So actually, you mentioned this, but I didn't cover it. The idea of having like voting for a poll or clearing a vote for a poll. There's polling in this database as well, which is an example you want to replace the CRUD with your own business logic. So you can write that and then just merge it in, basically. Um, this function here takes a schema, returns a schema, and there's heaps of stuff in a package called GraphQL tools for merging, diffing, all these sorts of things. Um, the, the, the basic building block is uh, called the GraphQL executable schema. And that's a thing you can programmatically manipulate um, and you can also programmatically execute against. It's like GraphQL itself doesn't even need the HTTP layer. You can just get an executable schema and call functions on it. Um, so everything else that you've seen in the space is just like more sophisticated versions of that, right? So in this case, we find Keystone um, and the stack that I've shown today works well when there's like a large density of stuff that wants to be local and a bit of stuff like maybe there's an 80-20 rule or something around that, right? That's where a stack like this would make sense. If you've got something where you've got five other schemas out there and you don't have a dominant one, um, you'd probably use a different set of tools like GraphQL Federation, but you'd still be able to use stuff like GraphQL CodeGen to drive as much of that as possible from like you still even if you your project is sophisticated for reasons that you can't achieve like or use this sort of stack you want to kind of like you know six out of ten ain't bad it's fine to have half the stuff i've shown you today you're still going to get a lot of benefit out of it and because there's so much tooling a lot of it works with other tooling as well like you don't don't be wary of anyone who tries to sell you a monolithic solution in this space because once they own all of your problem space, you're limited to what they can do, get stuff that's composable. Like Keystone's on the edge of that, but we've tried really hard to make it not own anything it doesn't need to. So it plays nicely with other things. Um, so yeah, you'd probably, that what you gave, you'd just get like another big schema and you'd mesh it in and that would work. Cool. Good question. You just um, reminded me of a point I left off my what makes GraphQL great is composability. Yeah, composability is so composable. You know, so, take yes. stuff from completely different systems and graph them together. And this is huge. All right. Any other questions? No. Right. Yes. Yes. Oh, yeah. Where? I'm kidding. <laughs> Turn around for one second. All right. I'm going to leave the Zoom and leave that with you and hand the screen sharing back. <laughs> 